I'm ready. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to um, this art talk that we have put together. <laughs> Sorry, my screen, I'm missing my thing. Um, all right, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this culturally curious art talk. Um, in case you don't know me, which I'm guessing a lot of you don't, uh, my name is Megan Buffard and I'm the information services librarian at Sargent Memorial Library in Boxborough. Um, so this is a collaborative program between a multitude of Massachusetts libraries. There's actually 17 libraries that were involved in promoting this um, program. And I'm sure as we've seen in the chat, there are people from all over. Um, so thank you to all libraries who have made this program so successful. And I will put a list of the libraries in the chat after I'm done introducing everything. Um, and Mina Jane, the director of Ashland Public Library has allowed us to use Ashland's Zoom webinar. So that's, we can fit so many people into this session. So thank you to her. Um, I just want to give a couple notes before we get started. Uh, if you would like to enable captions, um, you can do that at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Um, there's a caption button. Uh, if you have any questions, just put them into the Q&A um, feature and we will go over those at the end. Um, and then the session is being recorded. So we're going to upload it to the library's YouTube channel um, after, and everyone will get a link of that in case you missed anything or want to watch it again. Now onto the subject, which is Fierce Females, Women in Art. And it's going to be led by Jane O'Neill. So um, she is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. Um, Jane curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. She was born and raised in New Hampshire and has worked with some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she serves at, served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. She has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, and most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And if you want to check out more information, go to IamCulturallyCurious.com. Now I'm going to turn things over to Jane and see you all afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to everybody for taking time out of your day. I am deeply honored and humbled to have your time and attention, and I think we'll be on a really fun and interesting and hopefully empowering ride over the next hour as we get familiar, but get better acquainted with some of the fiercest females in the history of art. And I just love to start off with this image here. This is a 1943 uh, World War II poster of Rosie the Riveter. This is not Norman Rockwell's. The, uh, the artist here is J. Howard Milner. And it's such a great image in the sense that I think it, it just makes people want to be as strong and as beautiful as she was. Of course, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because this was an advertising campaign to get women out of their homes and working in, um, to, in manufacturing to support the war effort, but they were still kind of expected to be Betty Crocker back at home. So, um, a mixed bag with this image, but still always a great Halloween costume. So we are going to get started tonight with um, just a quick comparison here. And I want you to feast your eyes on these two images, just to get a sense in very broad brushstrokes in terms of the differences in the way that men and women have been depicted historically in the history of art. And maybe a few words come to mind as you look over here at Napoleon, who's rearing up on a horse with his um, cape here sort of billowing around him, his hand raised high. Maybe you're thinking confident, triumphant, a man of power, a man of consequence and action. And then we turn our attention to this lovely lady over here, painted in 1913 by the artist Edmund Tarbell, a New Hampshire artist. And this is simply called Reverie. 
And she's kind of lost in thought here. She's seemingly not even aware that we're looking at her. So we can kind of indulge in feast our eyes on, on this lovely woman and her lovely dress. She is really rendered more as an object, um, an object of desire rather than uh, a, a person of consequence, shall we say. So in, in broad brushstrokes, men have been depicted as, as active and women have been depicted as passive. And part of the reason for this huge disparity is that in the history of art, men have been primarily the makers of that art. And so we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. Um, but first I wanted to get back to the title of tonight's program, Fierce Females. Let's start off with a working definition of fierce for our purposes for tonight. What does it mean to be fierce? Well, um, for our purposes tonight, we will define it as women who created art that defied expectations and pushed beyond the boundaries of what was considered appropriate, acceptable, or desirable for their time. And I've got this incredible painting on the screen. This is a very fierce uh, female. This is actually um, a, a painting of a historic subject, a, a classical subject that was done in the 1600s by a woman artist named Elisabetta Siriani, a very little known artist because she, she died fairly young. But in this picture, she is showing a historical subject of a woman who is throwing her rapist down a well, and sort of pinwheeling awkwardly in, the, in this moment. But she is looking particularly tough and fierce here. And I would say that the artist was fierce as well. She only lived to about the age of 28, but during that short lifetime, she took on subjects of powerful women like this. And she also taught other women artists, trained them in, in the field. Now, here is just another glimpse at, um, at a fierce female. This is a film still from a film that's in museum collections around the world. The artist is a Swiss artist named Pippoletti Riest. And this is actually her in the film. And as the film progresses, she walks down a city sidewalk wearing this lovely blue gown and bright red shoes that sort of attract your attention. And she seems to be the very picture of, of femininity. And then all of a sudden she starts smashing car windows. What's that all about? Well, it's basically um, anti-authoritarian. It's an expression of freedom against the norms of feminine behavior. And believe it or not, the pop superstar Beyonce actually quoted this art film in um, a fairly recent music video that she did. And if you didn't know that she was quoting a, a, a piece of art, you might just think that it's like wanton destruction or something like that. Uh, but Beyonce is somebody who cultivates this idea of being a fierce female. Check this out. She quotes art history quite a bit, doesn't she? She's even um, summoning that, that J. Uh, Howard Milner image that we saw before. Tonight, unfortunately, is not about Beyonce. We're going to turn our attention more fully now back to um, our feast, fierce females in art. So what we're going to do in the very short time that we have, I've crammed a lot in, we're going to do the briefest overview of the history of women in art. And this is designed to give you as much information and as many surprises as possible. And then I have this list of, I think it's eight artists. So we're going to fly through them. And as, even though each one of them is deserving of an hour or more of your time, I'm going to zero in on what made them a fierce female, according to our working definition for tonight. And I couldn't resist uh, throwing this image into the into the PowerPoint as well. This is Adelaide Labille Guillard. This is a painting that's at the Metropolitan Museum. So maybe you've seen it in real life at some point, but she was working in the 1700s when not a lot of other women were working as professional artists. And she was also an artist that trained other young women. So you can see two of her pupils behind her. And here she is presenting herself as an artist at work in front of the easel. I just love the dress. <laughs> I love the way it's painted. And I love the idea that anyone would ever paint in a dress that looks like that. So let's get started on our very brief overview of the history of women in art. And if you've ever taken an art history class, this is probably going to be some flashbacks because we're starting off with prehistory. We are looking at prehistoric cave paintings dating back to about 
30,000 BC. This is the Chauvet Cave in France. And I just particularly love these um, cave paintings because they're very elegantly done. Uh, so elegant, in fact, that there's been disputes in terms of, of how just how old they are. But I love these overlapping horse heads in particular. You can tell that prehistoric man very carefully studied and understood the contours of those heads. And then that that subtle uh, suggestion of depth, uh, depth by overlapping them. Um, <clears throat> these cave paintings are filled with animals, all types of animals. But I, I wanted to show you another rendering of horses here. This is from the Peshmerl cave. You can see the animals have these huge bodies, these tiny little legs here. Uh, sometimes art historians even posit that these cave paintings were done to essentially provide an opportunity for target practice for hunters, um, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. But what's most important for our purposes tonight are the handprints here. Notice that there are many of them. That's really exciting because those sort of function like signatures to these works. And I remember being an undergraduate art historian and my big, uh, uh, my, my big survey textbook even had a little image of a, of a modern male artist, complete with his beret, demonstrating how prehistoric man would have made those negative handprints. They would have put minerals in their mouths, chewed them up, mixed it up with their saliva, and then put their hand on the wall and then spit that, um, that pigment on the wall to create that negative image. And so all this time I'm thinking, okay, prehistoric man painting in caves. That's great, that's great. Well, these handprints exist in, in um, caves where prehistoric paintings exist throughout the world. This is actually called the Cave of Hands in Argentina. And it was only about 10, 15 years ago that a group of anthropologists carefully studied and measured all of these hands and determined that three quarters of them were women's hands just based off of those proportions. So all, you know, all this time we've been thinking prehistoric man making these images. What were these images for? Were they for something masculine like hunting perhaps? No, but it was the, the very first image makers on this planet were women and we don't celebrate that nearly enough. So let's zoom forward to classical history. We're looking at ancient Greek vase painting right now. Two examples of red, red figure painting. Uh, in the example on the right here, we're actually looking down into a vase. And because of the typical subject matter of ancient Greek vases, we oftentimes just assume that they was, were all male artists. Look over here on the left, it's a battle scene. There's somebody with a club raised over their head. There's somebody who's already fallen here. And then on the right, it's a scene of homoerotic love. This was a very popular subject in ancient Greek vase painting. So we just kind of think, oh, okay, they must all be men. But we have this incredible clue that they were not. And it actually comes to us by way of this massive mosaic that was excavated in Pompeii. And what we're seeing is really one of the greatest works of the ancient world. It's about 17 feet long across, and it gives us this epic battle scene between Alexander the Great and Darius the Third over here. Look at all of these horses in unusual positions, some of them down on the ground. And if we zoom in over here on Alexander the Great, look at the detail in his face, in his armor, in his horse. This is absolutely incredible considering this is just done with these small colored tiles. Now, why do I bring this up? Because it is believed that this whole design of Alexander the Great and Darius the Third was inspired by an ancient Greek vase painting, something that wrapped all the way around a vase. And all we know about that original artist that inspired this work was that her name was Helen of Egypt. How many other Helens were there out there creating works that not only inspired other great works, but maybe just works that haven't been celebrated? So we're going to move forward another thousand years now into the Middle Ages. And I remember, again, as an undergraduate studying all of this and, and just being kind of delighted by all of these monks who led these very sort of cloistered lives and they'd um they'd illuminate these manuscripts and then add these like little cartoons these little doodles on the uh, in the margins and sometimes they would even show themselves so these are some great monk self portraits that entered into some of these most important illuminated manuscripts but we also have 
this incredible self-portrait of a nun. This dates to 1290. And this nun created this illuminated manuscript and created this self-portrait. Uh, and actually the text here translates to Gouda, a sinner, wrote and painted this book. And notice how she has her hand out there like that. It almost reminds me of the cave paintings. Here she is. This is the affirmation of self. This is believed to be the first woman in Western civilization to create a signed self portrait. And she was not the only one doing this work. In fact, once again, anthropology gives us some tantalizing clues here. This is the, um, the jawbone of a nun whose body was um, excavated in what is now Germany. Um, and this was a body that dates back to, I think, around uh, the year 900. And one of the most incredible things about it is this little piece of blue stone right here that's embedded into the jaw. What's the deal with that? Well, that blue stone was lapis lazuli. It was imported from thousands of miles away to create that beautiful cobalt blue that um, that artists would use to illuminate manuscripts. But only the best artists would get that very rare pigment, which ounce for ounce was more valuable than gold. So why did it end up in this nun's mouth? It was believed that she was probably licking her brush as she was doing her work. And that's how that little stone ended up there. So we have these little snippets of information that tell us that women have been participating all along. Their story are largely left untold. So now we're going to move up into the modern era and you're looking at a photograph of the artist Edmonia Lewis. She was born a free black woman in, um, in America in 1840. And she, um, she developed the, these skills in, um, in sculpture that, uh, that were getting her attention and getting her sales. So she began to create these portrait busts of people like the abolitionist John Brown. And she would sell them on the sidewalk in Boston, eventually raising enough money so that she could fund her way to go to Rome and receive the absolute best training in the world for a sculptor. Pretty exceptional thinking about what she was up against in the United States in the 1800s. So for the country's centennial anniversary, there was a huge exhibition, a big celebration really, in Philadelphia. And to uh, participate in that exhibition, Edmonia Lewis submitted this sculpture here, The Death of Cleopatra. I think it was something like 3,500 pounds. And so um, this was a work, it wasn't the only work about um, uh, about Cleopatra, but somehow this one got a lot of attention because she's in such an ungainly pose with like the breast exposed and her head kind of thrown back. But all attention, all, you know, all press is good press. It was good for Edmonia Lewis. It got her a lot of attention. And clearly you can see how talented she is as an artist. Now, here's the rub. <laughs> Shortly after this exhibition in 1876, this 3,500 pound sculpture went missing. Um, it was found in different places in a Chicago saloon. I think it was found in a junkyard. And uh, eventually, I think uh, not too long ago, actually, it, it, it was uh, rediscovered in, I think like a dog racing tracker something like that. And now it's in the Smithsonian. But the fact that such a significant work from such a remarkable person could essentially just be lost tells us how we value women's work in this world. So um, so we're going to wrap up this very brief history with, um, with a quick nod to a very important art historian named Linda Nochlin. And we see her here in the portrait with her daughter. This was painted by Linda Neal. Uh, Alice, Alice Neal, I'm sorry. So Linda Nochlin wrote a seminal essay in the 1970s called Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And a couple of threads to her argument were first that um, that women have been barred from uh, from training in the arts. We're looking at a painting here that's at the Metropolitan Museum called um, The American School. And notice there are no women there. <laughs> and for centuries, women have been barred from participating in this field in meaningful ways. And part of the argument for that is because um, an artist's training oftentimes involves studying nude models. And that was considered an inappropriate um, thing for a, a woman of any standing in society to participate in. So that was a huge barrier there. Another thread to Linda Nochlin's thinking 
was this idea of genius. We so easily associate artistic genius with men. Michelangelo, genius. Picasso's a genius. When's the last time somebody said Georgia O'Keeffe is a genius? We um, were wired or were programmed or were, um, were basically uh, 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 brought up to believe that men possess this creative, this, this, this vein of creativity that, that maybe women have never had access to. But tonight's program will certainly disprove that. So we'll end our quick overview with this great poster from this uh, collective group of anonymous um, artists and art historians called the Gorilla Girls. They call themselves the conscience of the art world. They make posters, they have events, that sort of thing. But this poster um, where we see a, a classical nude with the this gorilla head, they oftentimes wear gorilla masks because they are anonymous. And they pose the question, do you have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum? 5% um, of the artists in the, in the modern section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Think about how hard it is to get ahead in a field where you're expected to be naked. So let's turn our attention now fully to the artists, the stars of the show tonight. So we're going to move through these artists chronologically and going far back it, the um, the, we it's sort of slim pickings because like I said, most of these women did not have access to training. So our first artist was uh, working primarily in the 1600s in Italy. Her name is Artemisia Gentileschi. And we can see her here in a self-portrait, which is a, actually a remarkable flex for a female artist because she is painting herself as the very embodiment of painting, as the allegory of painting. And in the history of art, allegories, the embodiment of something, the rep the, the idealized representation of, of something were only ever women. So a man couldn't paint himself as the allegory or the embodiment of, of, of painting. She does this with very subtle cues, I should say too, and I think most modern day viewers wouldn't look at this and say, oh, she's an allegory. But the fact that her hair is kind of tousled and the fact that she's wearing this necklace that kind of looks like a mask, those would have been indicators to her contemporary audience in terms of what she was trying to achieve with this self-portrait. Now, Artem Artemisia Gentileschi was um, uh, able to have a career in the arts because it was the family business. Her father was an artist and he had a major workshop with a number of students. And so she was able to come under his wing and learn sort of at the hand of the master. This is her father's work over here. This is an ex another example of Artemisia Gentileschi's work over on the right. And it's the same subject in both pictures. And I think you could probably make the argument that, uh, that she gives this subject sort of a, a, a woman's perspective. The subject here is the biblical story of Susanna and the elders, which traditionally in the history of art has been an opportunity to tell a biblical story, but also show a naked woman. Susanna was a lovely woman who was um, bathing um, out in, you know, out in nature, and she was uh, spied on by these two old lecherous men who basically threatened her reputation unless she went along with what they wanted her to do. So this is the moment of confrontation in both of these pictures. Her father paints this confrontation as like a physical assault. Notice this man's hand is on her belly. She's grabbing his wrist. Um, she's picking the fingers off of her, uh, off of uh, her shoulder from this other, or actually it's from the same man over here, and her eyes are raised heavenward, almost looking for help. But notice just how placid her, her facial expression actually is. She's kind of enduring all of this um, with a remarkable stoicism. But Genta, Artemisia Gentileschi shows this moment in a very different way. These men are just whispering these little threats to her in this moment. But, um, but she paints her Susanna twisting away with sort of this pained expression on her face. And so we get a sense of, of just how... Um, just how uncomfortable uh, even just those whispers could be. And I think most women have probably lived through something similar to that. So it becomes a very relatable image. Now, Gentileschi famously um, was assaulted herself by a fellow uh, artist student in her father's workshop. There was uh, a very long rape trial that uh, that ensued, it lasted about nine months and actually Gen uh, Gentileschi uh, was subjected to thumbscrews, to actual torture in this trial to prove that she was telling the truth. 
And maybe because of that, or maybe independent of that, because it was sort of the style of the day, she went on to create images that are pretty, um, pretty violent <laughs> and oftentimes violent against men. And so this is probably her most iconic image here. This is Judith slaying Holofernes from about 1620. And this is another biblical story, and it's one that's been that's been painted throughout the centuries. And this was a style of painting and a subject that became sort of hot at the time. So she gives us this uh, this moment um, uh, right after the seduction between Judith, who's trying to kind of liberate her people, and Holofernes, who's this general who's laying siege to her people. Judith has just gone into his tent. She seduced him. He's fallen asleep, and now she and her maidservant are working to behead him. And the chaos of this moment is actually very carefully choreographed. And I love the choreography that she puts into this painting because his legs are sort of going back at this diagonal over here, but it's balanced by, by Judith's arms coming in from the other side. He pushes up towards the maid maidservant's neck and she pushes down on his neck. So there's, uh, there's this wonderful symmetry to this picture. Now, um, like I said, the subject here and the way that it's painted was hot for the time. And uh, the leading artist of the day, another Italian an artist named Caravaggio had painted the same subject just a few years earlier. And you can see his Judith is this kind of delicate flower who is somehow managing to behead somebody at arm's length with just a little bit of disdain in her face, right? But Gentileschi gives us a woman who has literally rolled up her sleeves and is in there doing the dirty work. She is a brave woman just as Artemisia Gentileschi was. And I think that's what makes her so fierce. So let's turn our attention now to our next artist. We're zooming ahead through time and we're heading over to France. Let me introduce you to Rosa Bonheur. Rosa Bonheur was actually the most famous woman artist in France in the 1800s. And almost everything you need to know about her is right here in this portrait of her, uh, where she is holding her artist portfolio. Um, she's She's got a, a, a pencil over here in her hands and she's just casually wrapping her arm around this bull who's also looking out at us very matter-of-factly. Um, Rosa Bonheur specialized in painting animals and just like Artemisia Gentileschi from, uh, from centuries earlier, uh, the only reason she was able to have this position, have this uh, role as an artist is because it was the family business. So if you wanted a nice sentimental naturalistic painting of your favorite dog or your favorite horse, you'd go to the Bonners because that's what they were good for. And these are two paintings by Rosa Bonner. You can see that, uh, I mean, she she really understands animal anatomy. She was very committed to learning that, uh, but she also had greater aspirations beyond that. She wanted to create something of great significance. So she started to attend the, um, the weekly horse fair that took place in Paris. And she actually had to get special dispensation from the French government in order to wear pants to just kind of move about freely and not attract attention to herself. Although I'm thinking the pants probably <laughs> attracted some attention in their own right. And she produced, as a result of all that study, she produced this painting called The Horse Fair from 1855. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's roughly 16 feet across, eight feet down. So it's like painting a whole wall in your house, but on this epic scale with all the detail of these horses. And we have them moving across the canvas, moving our eye across this canvas with all this energy, with all this motion. It's um, it's a really sort of nuanced and, and smart way to compose this, this major picture. So Rosa Bonner becomes celebrated for this and, and she delves into really understanding animal anatomy. She's somebody who would go to abattoirs and to zoos and carefully study animals so that she could really understand what she was painting. Now, as a person, Rosa Bonner was authentically herself. Even in the late 19th century, she smoked, she drank, she was openly gay, and um, and she made no apologies, uh, no no apologies for it. She once told a male friend. 
quote, if you only knew how little I care for your sex, you wouldn't get such queer ideas in your head. The fact is, in the way of males, I only like the bulls I paint. <laughs> so here she is um, with one of her long-term partners. She had just a few of them over the course of her life. And she is wearing in this picture the Grand Cross uh, uh, from the French Legion of Honor. She was the first woman to ever receive that award. So for being her authentic self, for um, pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable for a woman at that time and for creating these epic pictures about animals, Rosa Bonheur certainly qualifies as fierce. Now, we're going to turn our attention to Mary Cassatt, a name that I think probably everyone is familiar with. And um, believe it or not, there are some people that have really wanted to fight me on including Mary Cassatt in this presentation. Um, one librarian once was just like, no, 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 she was not fierce. <laughs> we see her here in a self-portrait from around the age of 30. Um, I'm going to make the case that, that she was, in fact, fierce. She was an American expatriate. She spent uh, most of her life in in France working as, as a professional artist. And she worked uh, primarily among the Impressionist artists. And I think most of us have probably seen the these types of pictures before, maybe in cards or on calendars, images of women and their children. Uh, I think these are like classic Mother's Day cards, right? And as I look at them, I always feel a little bit sorry for these women, because if you look very closely, don't they just look a tad bit bored? <laughs> As a woman, this is what uh, Mary Cassatt's life was relegated to, uh, a, a woman of, of sort of uh, upper class bearing. So uh, as she had to sort of stay in this domestic sphere and paint women and their children. But her friends, other impressionists like Edgar Degas, who remained her close friend for much of her life, he, as a man, Man could go out in Paris and, you know, take in the sights and sounds and paint these raunchier scenes. These are two images by Edgar Degas from right around the same time. This is an image of a vampy performer who's singing a song called Song of the Dog. And you can see from this kind of garish uplighting, you can just imagine the kind of like raunchy jokes that she was making. Over here on the right, we have an, another image by Degas that's called um, Women on a Cafe. A terrace. And uh, essentially all of these women were understood to be prostitutes at the time, primarily because of the dyed red hair here. So these are images that that Mary Cassatt could have never made, these little slices of life, what it looked like in Paris at the time. Instead, she was painting tea time, which I think is why uh, that one librarian wanted to fight me on, including Mary Cassatt. What's fierce about sitting at tea? Although I would argue that maybe this woman has just dropped some hot gossip and is sipping her tea after the fact. Well, there is a small moment in Mary Cassatt's career where she shows women out and about living their lives in Paris and having a great time and owning a certain power that we're going to get into. So she did a series of these theater scenes and they are incredible. If you've never been to the Paris Opera before, put that on your bucket list right now. We're looking at the opera from the stage. You can see that the ceiling's painted by uh, Marc Chagall and it's mostly floor seating, but then it's like this horseshoe shape, multiple levels of these balcony seats. And these balcony seats, I want you to understand them as almost like the pictures of celebrities that you see in the supermarket checkout aisle. That was your chance if you're sitting on the floor to look up and see kind of the rich and beautiful. And so Mary Cassatt gives us a, a moment looking at these people. Over here on the left, we see a portrait of Mary Cassatt's sister, Lydia, who's out at the Paris Opera. She's smiling. You can actually see her teeth. You never see this in the history of art, really. And she's having a great time. This is a really unusual picture because um, she's actually sitting in front of a mirror, even though it doesn't look like she's wearing a pearl necklace in her reflection. So everything that she that is behind her, that looks as though it's behind her, is actually out in front of her. So Lydia Cassatt is having a great time checking out all these people in their opera boxes. And in fact, Mary Cassatt Sat's paintings of the opera show a lot of women kind of um, taking on this agency of looking at other people. And there is so much power in this gaze. Um, just a very quick basic example of that. We've all been in the situation where you've had, you know, a tray of food in a cafeteria, and if you drop something and it clatters to the floor, 
all eyes are on you and you feel powerless in that moment. That is what it feels like to be an object in some ways, right? And so we kind of started tonight's program thinking about the male gaze, this idea that a, a man can create an image like this or a man can function in a world and render a woman as an object, make her this passive thing that is just there to be desired and to be looked at. Mary Cassatt gives us women who adopt that male gaze in the theater setting. This is a great work. Many of you have probably seen it in person. It's at the MFA in Boston, where we see this kind of serious looking woman in a black dress here and she's got her opera glasses and she is intently watching what the show i don't think so because if we train if we sort of extend this imaginary line from her binoculars there i think she's looking across the theater and checking out other people so she's taking on this role that traditionally only men had and if we follow this kind of balustrade that she's leaning on it takes our eye back to a man who's actually looking at her here we have two other women who are kind of um, secreted away in this opera box but using that agency there and i just have this one great detail too of the man who is looking back at this woman here. Now, this is a really unusual and kind of powerful way to show a woman. Another French Impressionist artist, Renoir, showed a couple that was uh, also at, uh, at, at the opera in their box. And he shows this woman as being nothing more than a decorative object. She's got the pearls, the flowers, the gold, all of it. She's even got her binoculars, but she doesn't have the agency to actually even use them. She's just there for our viewing pleasure. And note how her date is very clearly checking out other people. So Mary Cassatt's little uh, short brief uh, stint at the, at the Paris Opera, out and about at the theater, gives us a sense that she was actually a very fierce female. Let's head into the 20th century now. We're going to take a look at the work of Georgia O'Keeffe. She's sort of a superstar of American modernism. This is a portrait of her by Ansel Adams. And, um, and most of us just think of her because of her flowers, but she was a real revolutionary in so many ways. These are two examples of her early works and that show this interest in florals, but also an interest in modernism and an interest in abstraction. And she was able to sort of marry those two things together when she started painting monumental portraits of flowers in the 1920s. This is her resplendent red from 1924 and it's a beautiful painting it's about three feet tall and um and she invites you to consider every ripple every fold discover new colors within this picture there's all these yellows and lavenders and oranges in there you feel like it's lit from within one a uh, contemporary critic said that these flower paintings that she made made uh, made us the viewer feel like little butterflies resting on on the petals here this was a very unusual way to paint a flower of course prior to that um, there was a tradition of women painting flower paintings. This one goes back to about 1700. And for the most part, floral paintings were about bouquets and showing everything from bud to blossom to decay. It was about creating a balanced composition. It was about, you know, showing the bugs and, and, and the grasshoppers and all of that. But um, George O'Keefe is able to reframe that in a way that, that, um, that I think kind of dazzled and shocked people because I think everyone here has probably heard the theory at some point or another about what these paintings are actually of. <laughs> and this is, I, I love to do a program in person because these paintings tend to make grown adults blush and chuckle and that sort of thing. This is called Gray Line with Black, Blue and Yellow from 1923. But I think you could certainly make the case that this looks a lot like female anatomy. And the reason you've all heard this theory or thought of it on your own is because it was Georgia O'Keeffe's husband who was a major mover and shaker in the art world who first put forward that theory. Believe it or not, for six decades after that, she vigorously denied that reading of her flowers brings up this whole issue of like who gets to decide what these pictures are really about. Um, she said that they were just flowers. Here's just one more that I absolutely love. This is Jack in the Pulpit 4 from 1930. So by the 1970s, you get this wave of feminist art historians and, and they think, okay, well, if they're not about female anatomy, what are these pictures about? And the best way we can understand them is that they are about 
uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's kind of owning what she wanted to do with her artwork and doing something very revolutionary with a familiar subject. And that alone, I think, qualifies her as being a fierce female. Now, this next artist, one of our last, is probably one that's least familiar to all of you, and she's going to knock your socks off. Her name was Lee Miller, and we see her here in a uniform. She was a female war correspondent in World War II. She covered the U.S. Army in the European theater. She um, had a fascinating life. She started off her per professional career working as a model. She had moved to New York City and um, it was like one of those moments where she was accidentally going to step into oncoming traffic and somebody pulled her back onto the sidewalk and that just happened to be Condé Nast and within like a few weeks she was modeling for Vogue. She was a striking beauty but she was more interested in what was happening on the other side of the camera so she eventually moves to Europe and, um, and starts to study photography under the artist Man Ray. When when the um, when the war breaks out, she had the opportunity to go home. <laughs> she could have played it safe, but she thought there's a story to be told here. And she was very committed to telling that story with her camera and actually with her words as well. So we uh, on the left, we can see a photograph of a nurse, um, one of many nurses that was um, in this medical tent just down the beach from where uh, the Allies stormed the beaches at, at Normandy. And she was, um, they treated something like 4,500 patients after that particular battle, and they only lost about 50 patients. So we can see just how tough she is here. She's almost like a more somber Rosie the Riveter. We also see over here on the right, children um, celebrating the liberation of France. And there's just so much joy and playfulness in the scene. You almost would miss the fact that it's a wartime image if it weren't for like the missing tires and the sandbags over here in the background. Now, one of the most remarkable aspects of Lee Miller's career is that towards the end of the war, she actually gained access to, well, I, it was after the camps became liberated, I believe, or, or just before that, she gained access to some of the worst of the concentration camps. And so here is a photograph that she took at Dachau in 1945. And she took these photographs, recorded the horrors that she saw there, the, the people that had have been starved and, and, and treated like animals. She sent these images back to the United States, back to Vogue with the caption that said, believe it. And I, you know, it, it, how powerful is that? And, and I think the images that we have th that come from that camp, I think are this, you know, still living testament to just the atrocities that the Nazis committed. And without proof like this, um, I, there's a, uh, I think there's the ability to forget just um, just how awful and horrifying that was. From there, Lee Miller does the most remarkable thing. Um, on the day of Hitler's uh, suicide, she actually gained access to his apartment in Berlin. And she went into his apartment and took the first bath she'd taken in about three weeks. This is a photograph by her um, photography partner, a uh, man by the name of David Sherman. And it's a posed picture to, sh I mean, they put the picture of Hitler there on the bathtub and they probably put the sculpture there. But there are her boots with the, the dirt and the dust of the concentration camps in front of them. And she, here is this beautiful woman sort of contemplating all that she's seen in um while she was in, in Europe there. And it's become such a, a popular picture. I, I saw a recent spread, I think, in Vanity Fair. Here is Kate Winslet, the actress, uh, recreating that famous photo. So we'll turn our attention now to a real sort of rising star in the art world. I think everybody knows about Frida Kahlo at this point, um, or everybody's probably seen her face at this point. So Frida Kahlo was a Mexican artist who, um, who had uh, double tragedies, multiple tragedies in her life. But when she was just 18 years old, she was involved in a horrific trolley and bus accident where um, many bones in her body were broken. And she spent the next several decades going through numerous surgeries to try and recover from that. It was an accident so bad, it's surprising that she lived. But that meant that she was oftentimes in pain and that she was oftentimes bedridden. So she's an artist that did a lot of her work lying down. Um, 
And so uh, she was her own uh, best or most available model. So she did a lot of self portraits like we see here. And um, and you've probably, even if you're not familiar with Frida Kahlo, you've probably noticed the unibrow before and the mustache and that sort of thing. These were, um, these were specific choices that she was making. And they were choices to, again, be fierce, to defy what was expected of women at the time. And they got her noticed actually for being a beauty. She was featured in, in Vogue. Um, she It was a great way to attract attention. And believe it or not, there are Instagram models today who are doing just the same thing. But I think one of the most remarkable things about Frida Kahlo was that physical pain that she suffered so much in her life um, and how she shared that in her art with this remarkable vulnerability. Really, there's nothing that even touches it, nothing that comes close, save for maybe like Vincent van Gogh's self-portraits where you see his, his, um, his inner turmoil here. So she lays it all bare here in this um, uh, self-portrait called Broken Column from 1940. She's ripped open her body to show her broken spine as a broken column. She is wearing um, this brace that's like literally keeping her body together. There's actually steel underneath those canvas straps. And she is covered, she's covered herself in these pins and nails. The, the landscape behind her echoes this torn body too. And there's just tears streaming down this rather stoic face here. So she's she's laid it all out. Um, these two uh, images relate to surgeries that she was going through around uh, 1946. Uh, she oftentimes showed herself in two different forms. So in this case, she's an anonymous patient on a modern hospital gurney. And then over here on the right, she is wearing more like traditional Mexican clothing and holding a sign that says the tree of life remain firm. Notice once again, how how, um, how the landscape sort of echoes her pain and those breaks with um, with all of these fissures and cracks here, and then um, the bleeding wounds and, and incisions in her back. Over on the right is one of her strangest paintings. It's pretty surreal, actually, and it's the wounded deer. Um, here, uh, the surgery that she had hoped would really solve a lot of her problems, it did not go as planned. So she puts her face on the head of this deer that has been pierced with something like nine arrows. And so we know that this deer isn't going to survive. And still, once again, she's looking out at us with the recognizable unibrow and this really um, sort of serene expression on her face. And now um, the landscape, once again, sort of matches this kind of eerie mood here. There's lightning in the background and, and and this uh, forest seems to be falling apart. Believe it or not, Frida Kahlo actually gave this portrait of the wounded deer to her friends as a wedding present. <laughs> so um, towards the end of her life, she actually had a leg amputated. Um, she went through, I think, something like seven surgeries in one year on her spine. And this was her doctor that was doing that work. And she just uh, truly respected him and was so grateful for the work that he did. She did another self-portrait where she's um, sitting in a wheelchair. She's painted her artist palette as a, an anatomical heart. And then she has like this quiver of, of paint brushes over her lap that look like they're dripping either red blood or red paint there. But didn't she just do such a great job in terms of nailing his uh, portrait there? Now I will finish up on Frida Kahlo with just um, one last image here and it's called The Dream of the Bed from 1940. And um, it's such an unusual image. It also feels a little surreal because we're floating in the sky in this canopy bed and she is at peace, she's at rest here and there are these green vines growing all over her, like the suggestion of renewal and hope maybe. But above her on top of this canopy is this giant skeleton who's in the same position as her uh, with two pillows sort of leaning towards us. His body is wired with dynamite and he's holding a bouquet of flowers. So it's sort of like that suggestion of even when things are going well, I mean, death could happen at any moment. Believe it or not, Frida Kahlo actually slept in a canopy bed with that skeleton on top of it. Um, she thought it was funny. I guess her husband didn't really love it that much. <laughs> so our next artist is Elizabeth Catlett, another American artist. She was 
half Mexican, half black, and um, worked primarily as a printmaker and a sculptor here. She, uh, she was really interested in printmaking because you can make multiple copies from the same image. Uh, prints are less expensive. And for her, the purpose of making art was for people to tell the story of struggling people. And she worked in, uh, in a style that was largely realistic because she wanted her images to be meaningful. This is an example of her printmaking work. Um, it's, uh, it's a 1952 linoleum cut. And you can see, I mean, every incision here, just how precise and pristine the, the wood cut is here, the linoleum cut is, excuse me. And we see this woman who we're looking up at as though we're exalting her. But we also see that she is impoverished. Uh, she's, you know, secured her jacket here with a little safety pin. Uh, and she's looking off in the distance almost as though she's imagining a different future for herself. Elizabeth Catlett called this um, the sharecropper. And so with the title, we immediately understand that this is a woman who is trapped in this cycle of economic exploitation. So in addition to showing everyday people, Elizabeth Catlett uh, created images about heroes from African-American history. This is, of course, Harriet Tubman leading um, uh, slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad. Notice the hierarchy of scale here with Tubman being so much larger and this very strong arm that's set against the white background, um, just showing just what a remarkable person Harriet Tubman was. And then, Elizabeth Catlett made these images about really how scary it was to be a black person in, in mid in the mid 20th century. Uh, this work over here is called A Special Fear I Have for My Loved Ones. And we can see a black man with a noose around his neck. It looks as though he's been lynched and maybe cut down from the tree and there are people standing on, on that rope there. This one is from 1946 and it's called I Have Special Reservations. And we can see uh, people who are living in segregation, sitting at the back of the bus where it was for colored only. So um, I, I think, you know, we, we understand today just uh, what a heated issue race can be in this country and to confront it head on and to show the realities and the violence of what it means to be a black person in America in this way, I think characterizes uh, Elizabeth Catlett as, as an extremely brave person. We'll finish up with just um, one last sculpture from her. And this is called Phyllis Wheatley. It's in bronze. It's in multiple museum collections. She did it in 1973. I love it because it feels timeless. I love this woman in the beanie because she sort of looks like somebody you see studying at a Starbucks. You know, she looks very thoughtful in this moment. It's actually um, a reference to a woman who was captured into slavery in the 1700s. And she, um, she was like a savant. She learned, I think, three different languages, English, uh, maybe Greek and Latin by the age of 14 and published her own book of poetry. This is the frontispiece to that book of poetry. She, uh, Actually, George Washington met Phyllis Wheatley too. So here she is in that same pose and this is Elizabeth Catlett's nod to her. Um, so for all of these reasons, I feel like Elizabeth Catlett certainly qualifies as a fierce female. And our very last tonight is somebody who's still alive, Maya Lin. And, um, and she's someone who I think is, is pretty familiar to many. She is a Chinese American architectural designer. And we see her here with her winning design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, this was a blind competition and Maya Lin was only a, a college student when she submitted her plans um, as possible design for this war memorial to, um, to be installed on the mall in Washington, DC. And so it was selected without knowing who she was, what her credentials were really. And of course, here it is over on the mall. I think most of us have probably visited it at some point. Um, and it was, uh, you might remember, it was, it was somewhat of a scandal when it was revealed who she was because she came from an Asian background, not a Vietnamese background, but, um, but just uh, her, her gender, her her ethnicity here, the, and her age all came into play. In fact, um, Ross Perot publicly referred to her as being an egg roll when her name was revealed. And of course, these days, we know that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is one of America's most favorite um, architectural sites. It's these highly um, polished 
panels of black granite that contained the names of the more than <clears throat> 58,000 58, uh, American soldiers that were lost in that war. And it's a, it's a scar that's cut into the earth. It's a place where you can go and, and connect and literally reflect. You can take a rubbing, take part of this, this, um, this sculpture home with you. It's something that acknowledges that, that the Vietnam War was uh, a very different war from, uh, from, previous uh, military engagements. And it provided a space for people to reflect on that and to mourn the loss of all of those lives. So just a quick peek at one other monument that she did. This is at the Southern Poverty Loss uh, Center in Montgomery, Alabama. This is the Civil Rights Memorial. And in some ways it looks very similar. It said highly polished black granite. And in this case, there's a water feature that ties in so nicely with the Martin Luther King quote up there. Um, and it also includes the circular timetable of the civil rights movement. And that also has water that kind of spills up and over the edge. So imagine what it's like to walk around that timetable to see a moment that you remember or to see something that, that touches you as you're reading it and to reach out and touch that cold stone. And because it's wet, when you take your hand back, you're kind of changed because of that moment, because of that experience. Maya Lin could really, can really create uh, sculpture and, and public monuments that, that really move you. So here she is receiving the National Medal of Arts um, back in 2009 from President Obama. Uh, like I said, she's still alive. She actually just uh, designed the new library at Smith College. She's doing remarkable things and, and we're so lucky because we'll be seeing more from her, I'm sure. So to just quickly wrap up tonight's presentation, uh, where do things stand for women in the arts? Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a very mixed bag. Women haven't made too much progress. I think the Me Too movement has brought into focus um, that women need to be at the table. And so we see some museums sort of making a, a little bit of effort. For example, the Baltimore Museum of Art decided to only collect women artists just for one year. Um, but for the most part, it is still very much a struggle. So we will end tonight on a hopeful note, a note of clarity, again from the Gorilla Girls, that remind us that you're seeing less than half of the picture without the vision of women artists and artists of color. So I will end there for tonight and I welcome any questions or comments that you have about women in the arts. And I also invite you to visit my website too, which is I Am Culturally Curious. You can find out more about what we do there or find um, links to other Zooms on other topics. I'll start going through the Q&A too. Let's see, an anonymous attendee has said, is there a significance to the hand earring in the first Frida Kahlo self-portrait? I'm so glad you asked about that because there is significance to that. It's a strange earring, but it was given to her by Pablo Picasso. And I have to say, if Picasso gave me jewelry, I'd wear it too. I'd paint a picture of myself wearing it. Um, Marcia asks, may I ask if these artists were successful in their lifetime or posthumously? Great question. Um, off the top of my head, most of them found success during their lifetimes. I, I can't think of one of the artists that I showed you tonight who um, who wasn't uh, essentially fairly well known during their lifetime. Yeah, they, they all found success as I'm going through that. Um, and Sally asks, where is the Civil Rights Memorial? Uh, that is in Birmingham, Alabama at the Southern Poverty Law Center. And Mary, oh, Mary, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm, I'm delighted that you're here tonight, Mary. I'll also start going back through the chat too to see, oh, Maureen asked, notice that hand too, perhaps an, an homage to hands. Oh, from the cave paintings, oh, Maureen, you just tied everything together so nicely. That's so great. So Frida Kahlo's hands are like those prehistoric cave paintings. It all comes together great. Um, and let's see here. Going back through the chat, um, let's see. Uh, um, I just shared Jane's website in the chat. Uh, I am culturally curious dot com, which I think yes dot com, um, and that. I don't know if I saw any other questions in the chat. I think it's. A lot of thank yous. Um, and yes, we will be sending out a um, 
there will be an email sent out with a link to the recording. Um, it looks like there are other questions. Are there other artists that you wish you could include or is there a part two to this? Oh my goodness, you're so good to ask. There is a part two coming out in March. So off the top of my head, I'm thinking who are the artists included in that, but I, I'm just so, I, I'm overjoyed right now just reading some of the comments in the chat. My, my brain can't uh, fully focus on that, but look for that in March. I do a featured, uh, new featured program every month. And next month, I'm very excited to debut a new program on the artist Kahinde Wiley. And in March, sort of in celebration of Women's History Month, we're doing Fierce Females Part Two. So you'll be able to find um, free Zooms for that on my website too. Oh, F F uh, Sally mentions Faith Ringgold. I'm so glad you mentioned her. I actually have a whole program just on Faith Ringgold. She is incredible. And yes, there was that, that great little exhibition at the Worcester Art Museum. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, Thank you everybody for all of the, your kind words. I really appreciate it. And um, just remember those handprints that women were the start of all of this. We have so much to um, to celebrate in that. Uh, and I just wanna thank you so much, Jane, for all of your knowledge and these great programs. <laughs> I know I learned a lot. Um, uh, us, I mean, Jane has lots of other programs. Like she said, visit your her website. Um, we are, this collaboration is also going to have a second program in February on February 21st. It'll be on African Americans as subjects and creators in American art. So um, that already has a Zoom link. Um, I mean, for your home library, if they were a partner, or um, you can go to the Sargent Memorial Library website, which is boxlib.org, or Jane's website, I'm sure, has links to <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> um, but I think that that it looks like there's no more questions. So I, I have to I do just have to say that oh, I, yeah. I've, I've read everything in the chat. I really appreciate all of the, the, the very nice comments and the feedback and the suggestions for artists to include in, in part two. So thank you, everybody, so much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it.